those third person things, you know. <laughs> Why can't you just say, I like this or I like that? Tony Hatter likes this. <laughs> thank you, Margaret and Howard, for inviting us. It's really great. And all, thank you, everybody, for coming out. It's lovely. Um, well, those of you who know me pretty well know that I write pretty weird stuff from time to time, so here we go. <laughs> Things to remember while bathing. Only those who are very strong without first consulting a physician. Any boy can make a little anemometer, causing vertigo and unconsciousness. It is always a good scheme to rest for short intervals before erecting a post with a small flat ring of iron. It is dangerous to dress ourselves. You may make a donkey in much the same way, and a pipe cleaner without spools attached will do. A novice entering the water for the first time should move about as much as possible, jumping up and down and dipping. Make a round hole and four tin funnels. A muddy bottom should be avoided. No time must be lost in getting into the water. Push them in tightly near the tips of the wooden arms. Six or seven inches seems scarcely noticeable. Only those who are very strong wear a great deal of jewelry without consulting a physician through a small hole in the window shutter. <coughs> Take an army consisting of small men and short men, a harmonious riot of purple. A muddy bottom should be avoided with four ten funnels. Move about as much as possible. Take your donkey into the water for the first time with a small flat ring of iron. It is dangerous to dress ourselves in a great deal of jewelry. It is always a good scheme causing vertigo and unconsciousness. Take an army consisting of tall men and short men jumping up and down and dipping. A harmonious riot of purple without first consulting a physician. Nowadays, many homes are equipped with mechanical refrigeration. Those are all facts from my children's book of knowledge, 1950. <clears throat> Wyoming. We took the white moth for a sign. It fluttered in the lamplight, and when it grew tired, as being a moth in a place as big as Wyoming is hard, it floated down to our bed and became nearly invisible against the starched white motel sheets. We watched the moth for a long time. It seemed to be telling us something important about our future, that we would fly, but that there would be difficulties, that we should treat each other with delicacy and learn to see by the shine at the tips of our wings. Um, <clears throat> housekeeping is not my forte. So this is a poem about that, pretty much. Real estate. The melon grew a little smaller every day, or was it simply getting flat on the bottom where it sat on a shelf in the fridge? beige colored veins like an old lady's hosiery roll down past her knees. The smell we could ignore mostly. It was organic after all, but so was the dead mouse behind the piano. We knew it was there, but nobody wanted to do anything about it. When we sell the house, we said, the mouse and the melon must both go. <laughs> Pretty much true. <laughs> This is my latest little book uh, called As If Royalty, As If on Fire, and I'll just read one from there. It's based on a picture by, a painting by Peter Bruegel the Elder. Village of Fools. Except for the boy tumbling headlong out of the upstairs window, it's hard to summon much pity for them, the fools in the village for the man who thinks if he shaves the hide of his pig, he'll end up as rich as his neighbor who's shearing sheep, wool piling up at his feet. But this boy, how did it happen? One moment he is sitting on the privy, trousers off,
perhaps in a reverie about sailing away from the village in one of the grand ships he sees anchored in the harbor. The next he's plummeting down, his bottom as naked as that sheep. Is this the boy's dream? The dream we all fall victim to at some anxious time in our foolish lives? When suddenly we're naked, our pale, prepubescent body exposed to the entire school, the entire town. We wake in a swivet and bless the sound that roused us from our most awful shame. Surely, living in the village of fools, the falling boy has much to be anxious about. Everything in the village is broken. Every odor wafting from every door is noxious. Every spark sets a house on fire, and everyone is too busy being foolish to bring water to put the fire out. Being a fool is fraught. You can't step out your front door without confronting someone who for no reason at all is stabbing a hog in the belly with a short-bladed knife. Or perhaps it is you there in the foreground being cloaked in heavenly blue by your beautiful wife the message only you of all the village fools don't understand. Before the eye of this day's sun closes, I will make of you an even greater fool. All the while the boy falls and falls, his privacy forever absent, his worry not so much will he be hurt when he lands, as will the fools finally turn their gaze to him and seeing him fall, laugh. this is about. This is the day the Lord. You must fill in all the columns, check tangerine or plum. Renting online allows you to use a non-chipped card. Larceny is rampant, but today is the day of penitence, the day the Lord went up to the sky holding a bouquet of daffodils. Uncanny the way the hostess, in all modesty, managed to graze her fingers along his sinewy hip just before he rose up in his overdue leaving, the pile-up of apostles pushing and shoving to sea, the splashing of saline rain from his articulated arms and legs. Just like a real man, they all said later, around the Formica table at the Unity Church. The safety of small birds. If God could write the safety of small birds, I might believe, if only the effigies by the side of the road, if only the mountain on fire at the top of the stairs. Once when I was lost in Chicago, a terracotta man with hair made of snails took me to see a blind whale. And I thought, if God can make a blind whale to live in a city among small birds, I will not believe. The man said it is because I am lost, but I know it is because the rage of God, the stripe, the stipple, the blocks of blackness climbing through the woods along the river. I climb through the woods along the river, the striped and stippled blocks of blackness speaking of the rage of God. It is because I am lost, the man said, that I do not believe. Even while I live in a city among small birds, and a blind whale, they say, was also made by a god whose hair of snails fills oceans and flows in the streets of Chicago, where a man made of terracotta met me at the top of the stairs, a mountain on fire. I might believe if only the effigies by the side of the road, if God could write the safety of small birds. This is about somebody named the Great Conde. I don't know who, we, who he is or was. The Great Conde. He came down from the Finger Lakes to deliver the eulogy. All the gullible second-class passengers were in a fervor. Look how bucolic he is, they said. And he's the most truculent Dahlia we've ever seen, they said. The Great Conde's accent mark was broken. He tried to repair it with a Dremel tool, but all that came out of that experiment 
was a new requirement that he walk with a crutch. I've never had a baby, but I, I put babies in a lot of my poems for some reason. Here's a baby poem. Soapy hot water. The babies waddling all day among river reeds, messing about with frogs and the occasional dead rodent. Nothing a baby likes better than a dead rodent. They're like dogs that way, rolling on the ground in the stink. He put the babies in soapy hot water, and the Dalmatian went in too. His fault the babies even found the dead rodent. One of the babies had eaten a frog at some point during the long, hot, hungry day. And as soon as that baby got clean, why, up came that frog, still wriggling, although a little the worse for wear. The other babies were, of course, delighted at this fantastic trick, and each vowed to go back to the river and eat a frog at the earliest possible opportunity. Poem for a real estate salesman. He continues to sell houses, the sky-eyed, open-doored houses, breezeways instead of garages, the houses young couples with a baby think they can just about manage. He likes the houses he sells, and the couples. He likes that to them it is April, and he likes the way they think all the miserly bits of fluff in the house are so pretty. And he likes to boast back at the office how the wife was definitely flirting with him when the husband was checking out the backyard. It's a longer, little bit more serious rant. Little Rooms. She has replaced all the proud new furniture bought during the California years. Those were the maple years early American years. Those were the redwood lawn furniture years, before she lost her face years. She replaced her face with antiques, lavishly tended philodendrons and cats. The last time I saw her, the new couch that had replaced the antiques that had replaced the maple. Did I mention that the antiques were fakes, bought from the Yield House catalog? Did I mention the dictionary stand on its spindly legs, wobbling like an elderly ant on her third glass of sherry? The furniture expands and withdraws in that small house. The blue-green shag replaces the rag rug. The andirons come and stay, even though my mother cannot breathe in the fire. Replacing my father in those days, those days only the furniture breathed, you could find him in the bedroom that my mother had supposed would be mine if I ever came back to live in that house. If you could find my father, sometimes by accident, sitting in my old basket chair, reading the paper or a pogo book, or doing a crossword puzzle. My father might look up when you came in, or he might not. He might speak or not. What is certain is that when my mother entered the room, carrying in her outstretched arms something like a dead child, everything that she had lost, and demanded that my father explain, he glanced up at her and said, oh, hmm, nice, and went back to his paper or his book or his puzzle without ever having seen what my mother carried, without ever understanding her loss or her subsequent rage. And he never commented on the mirrors that went missing, the furniture that ebbed and flowed through that house, until all that was left was ripped naugahyde. All that was left were the new towels she'd bought in 1968. The yellow irises faded to a blur of sunlight. Another poem with the line, everything is broken in it. I, that's a Bob Dylan line, and it made its way into a couple of these. Everything is broken. Never worry about the sudden plummet or the too rapid ascension. The Dalmatian coast is one for surprise endings that, in the end, were not really surprising at all. The tone-deaf violinist and the liverish de delivery man as likely to loot your empty apartment as bring you a poached hare or a goose. The folks here like to keep you guessing. Everything is broken. 
The more fixable items appear back on store shelves. The rest get thrown away, only to be salvaged by the truly poor, the rodent hunters, the ones who will become looters when the lights, as they always will, go out. And this, I guess, is the two poem warning. <laughs> I tried to do good works when I was very young. I don't know, make up for all the bad works I was also doing. Candy. Because of the candy, I was gasolined up. All my levers were pedal to the metal. I smelled of witch hazel. The isotope candy was pink and hard as hell to swallow. I made a deal with the devil that night. I can't tell you what it was. The devil insists on secrecy. He's been burned by bishops and popes and other chalice-wielding perverts. He gave me the candy in a pink and white striped paper sack. The world was inside, but only small broken pieces. Like the uniform I wore the first time I tried to be a saint and worked out at the county hospital. I had to take a bus. It was miles and miles away. There was a little apron and a cap. Mostly, I did it for the outward signs of goodness. I could never figure out what I could do for the patients other than let them look at me, their candy striper. Hmm. And this is the last one, and I'll close, and thank you all again for being here. Hi. Okay, thank you. A good day. That Thursday, all the balloons in the world were released into the sky all at the same time. Well, at least in the part of the world where it was day, and the children were let out of school, and everyone got off work early, and people forgot that they were supposed to be pissed off about the election or the price of gasoline or the long wait at the TSA line at the airport. The balloons, each one took some sort of worry away with it, a small bit of anxiety, so that people who normally felt okay suddenly felt amazing and light and free, and people who were usually anxious felt at least a kind of gladness beginning to penetrate, a small opening where maybe light could get in. The balloons couldn't take everything, of course, so dogs were still unhappy about fireworks, and chickens still pecked the littlest hen on the head until she was bald. But by and large, it was a good day. Mm. Thank you. Yeah.